So which casting method is better, ceramic shell or investment? Let's find out. I've got two wax bison that I just poured out. One of them's gonna go in investment, the other one's gonna go in ceramic shell. And we'll see what the final result is. Let's go. The first step is the wax chasing. I need to make sure I blend away any parting lines that were left from the mold and fill in any bubbles that get left behind when you're casting the wax. It's a lot easier to fix it now than when it's metal. The base is cast separately in wax and then I have to fuse it together so it's one piece. I find this looks better than welding it after the fact and it's easier. Once that's done, I heat up a piece of metal and rub the wax sculpture over it to make sure the bottom is completely flat. So the wax chasing is done, that's ready to go, and I'm gonna do the suspend a slurry one first. The first thing we need to do is make some pouring cups. I take foam coffee cups and coat them with layers of wax. This will make a funnel for me to pour the metal into, and the wax will allow me to attach the sprues easier. I think that'll work. So now I have to sprue this up and make sure everything is vented very well. In order to get the best quality casting, I need to cast these thin and hollow, so I need to carve a hole into the wax body. This will allow the ceramic to get inside and make a core that will prevent the metal from filling the body cavity. Then that piece is sprued up so I can attach it to the spruing tree and weld it on later. To make the sprue tree, I attach a long sprue to the pouring cup. It takes a while for the molten wax to set up, so I usually take some canned air and spray it on. That freezes everything instantly. Sometimes that's tricky, so I ask my wife for some help. Ah, my fingers! Ugh. Does it hurt? Thankfully my fingers didn't get frostbitten and fall off. I want to make sure it's fused together very well and then I'll attach it to the sculpture. When I need smaller vents I'll just cut a bigger sprue into quarters. I don't want air to escape the same hole that metal is flowing into. So like the bloodstream, I want a circulatory system where metal goes in one way and air flows out another. I need to make sure that every high spot has a vent, otherwise a bubble will get trapped there. I've heard people say that the ceramic is gas permeable, which means if I have enough hydraulic pressure, it'll actually force the air through the shell. However, I haven't tested that. So just to be sure, I'm gonna make sure it's vented extra well. So I think that'll work for the suspend a slurry model. I'm gonna get started on the investment model now. With the slurry model, I have more freedom to put the vents, but with the investment model, I'm bound by the size of my flask. I have to conform it to fit. And sometimes it's a tight squeeze and not the most ideal shape. But with the investment, I also have the luxury of vacuum casting, which helps draw the metal through the mold. This hole is to vent the inside so that investment can flow in and make that core. Now back to the slurry model. It's time to coat it in the ceramic. I'm using suspend a slurry. It's a special liquid that air dries and you put layer after layer over your model and that makes the shell to hold the molten bronze. The first layer goes on by itself and once that's dry, I'll do it again and start adding layers of sand. It's my understanding that the sand helps add bulk and strength to the mold. Each day I add another layer, sometimes two layers in a day. I've been told to put about nine to 10 layers on. One of the things I see happening is the hole that I have here is starting to close in. Remember I cut the hole in there so the slurry can get inside. But what I don't want to have happen is seal off this hole and have the slurry not be able to dry inside there. Because then when I heat it up, I fear it's gonna crack. I'm not quite sure what to do about that. For now, I think I'm gonna plug the hole and hope that it's thick enough inside. This paper towel will work as a plug. And then I'll just keep dipping. Just two more layers. I think that's finally got enough layers on it that it's ready to go. It's taken me about a week to get to this point. So that's one thing about suspend a slurry. It takes more time. But this is dry 
We'll take it to the burnout stage next. But first, we've had our other bison just sitting here, chilling out, waiting for its turn. So let's get the investment version ready. I add some tape on top to prevent overflow, and that's mainly for when I put it in the vacuum chamber. So for the flask that size, the volume is 157 cubic inches. I look at my cheat sheet that I made up. It means seven pounds of investment and 43 ounces of water. The investment is weighed out and so is the water. And then it's all mixed together, water first. I normally put the investment in a vacuum chamber to help draw out any of the bubbles that get trapped during the mixing. However, my vacuum pump malfunctioned, so this step didn't really work all that well. So in as little time as it takes to change your shirt, that cures. And in about two hours, it'll be ready to steam the wax out. So investment is a lot faster to get your stuff ready. I had trouble with the vacuum pump. I don't know why, wasn't pulling the bubbles out. Because it sets so quickly, you kind of have a short window. So if something goes wrong, you gotta run with it. I'm just hoping the surface doesn't have a lot of bubbles on the finish. We'll see. To remove the wax, I just put a little bit of water on the bottom, elevate the flask so it's not sitting in the water, and let the steam melt it out. It takes about an hour, sometimes two for a bigger flask. This allows me to capture the wax so I can reuse it, and it also keeps my kiln a lot cleaner. As I put it in there, I realized I forgot the chaplets again. I always forget the chaplets. Chaplets are metal pins that go inside and that keeps the core in place so it doesn't break off and shift around. The only thing that's holding it is the hole where I cut the piece out and let the investment goes in. There's a little bridge there. I'm just hoping that doesn't break off. So I gotta be gentle with that thing. So it's time to burn this one out. And this is my first time using this burnout furnace and I'm just gonna assume it's gonna work perfectly. Because what other way is there to be? You can see how I built the burnout kiln in another video. So far, it works pretty well. I was able to get the shell melted out quickly without any visible cracks in the shell. The shell then needs to get hot enough to vitrify. It's kind of the same process that pottery goes through. So I'll heat both the investment and the ceramic shell up to pouring temperature and we'll see how they go. Once all the wax is thoroughly burned out and they're hot enough, I get the metal ready. Then the flask of investment will go on my vacuum table. But in order to do that, I first need to flip it over. Remembering that the core inside doesn't have the chaplets and it's very fragile. The vacuum should be drawing air through this right now, but I noticed that the pressure hasn't gone up at all. I try to adjust the flask to get a better seal and then realize I just need to add more caulk. And that worked. The investment breaks up and dissolves away when it's quenched, unlike ceramic shell. Then it's time for the ceramic shell. I get rid of the vacuum casting setup and bring in a bucket of sand. Now I've heard you don't really want to bury your ceramic shell in sand. If you do, it has to be completely buried, not halfway. If you bury it halfway, it cools at different rates, which can cause problems. So in this case, I'm just using the bucket of sand for a safety measure. If the shell breaks, the metal will run into the bucket of sand instead of all over the floor of my garage. I've heard a cold piece of iron can freeze metal and help stop leaks, but it's just too badly cracked. I don't want to give up. I keep trying, but it's futile. There's nothing I can do.
Some people will wrap thin wire into their slurry as they make layers. I've been told by some that the wire can actually cause it to crack more. However, I'm wishing I had had wire in here now. I've actually used wire in another project and that was the most successful casting I had. So going forward, I think I will wrap a very thin wire in the ceramic shell. The ceramic is actually fairly challenging to break off. It doesn't want to come off easy. So what I can't chisel off, I'll try to grind off with the wire wheel. And the wire wheel chews it away pretty good. I'll do the same thing for the investment model. And what the wire wheel doesn't get, I'll get with the sandblaster. So now that they cleaned off a little bit, you can see the ceramic shell one is really flawless. It has a really high quality finish, really turned out well, apart from the shell breaking and not being able to finish the casting. I'll cut it off and turn it into a bookend or something. We'll still save part of it. The only problem I see is in the nostrils here, there's two bubbles. When I submerged it, those bubbles didn't get replaced. There's one small bubble in the corner of the eye so that's something I need to watch out for. It's much harder to get the ceramic shell out of all the little spaces. I think Sandblaster is really your only option, but the quality is really good. With the investment casting, equally the surface is very good. Because my vacuum chamber had a few issues, I didn't get all the bubbles out. You can see there's some bubbles here and there. I'll just file those off. It won't be a problem. On the face, you can see there's a little crack in the investment, so I have a little bit of flashing. But to be honest, that's fairly easy to take off. Can even do it by hand here. Let's get it welded back up and finished. I cut off all the sprues and with the investment model, I clean out everything on the inside. All the investment is soft enough that I can actually get it out. However, with the ceramic shell, the core is so hard that I'm not gonna be able to get that out. So I'm gonna leave it in. Actually, with ancient bronze statues, they've been able to do carbon dating on the cores left behind. So cores aren't always removed. However, I do grind enough of it away to make the cap able to fit. My welding table is just a steel plate. I use silicon bronze filler rods and I weld it as carefully as I can. Then I grind away the weld bead and make it invisible. Then I file away the grinder marks. So that piece is welded back on and chased fairly well. I'll do a little more. We still have to clean the sinuses because you got bubble up in there. We'll dremel that away. But next, let's go back to the investment one. Now, unfortunately, the tail is missing. I don't know if it broke off or if it just didn't cast. So now we got to play a game called weld the tail back on the bison. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this little piece of sprue, cut it off, weld it to the tail nub, and reshape it with my dremel. Welding small pieces like this is tricky for me. I tend to melt through things, so I turn the heat way down and go slow. So now that that's stuck on there, I'm gonna shape it with my Dremel. This is the same as it would be carving in wood. I just try to remove all the metal that doesn't look like a tail. Not too bad. And then I weld the cap back on this one. You might be wondering why I carved a hole in two different spots. In this case, the side is the smoothest, least detailed area. But on the suspender slurry model, I wanted to make sure the slurry was able to drain out when it was drying. And that's the only reason I picked two different locations. Once the metal chasing is done and it's all blended in, I go over it with a sandblaster again, and then the wire wheel. 
So one thing to note about the suspender slurry. I've done a total of four projects with a suspender slurry. I've done two sagebrush lamps, a grizzly bear, and that bison. And in those projects, I'd say I've used a little over a third of the bucket. This bucket, including shipping, was about $300. That's not cheap. Another thing I've noticed is the lower the level goes, the harder it is to dip things. So when I get to the bottom, when there's a fourth of the bucket left, it's not like you can submerge anything in there. Maybe you can scoop it out and pour it over to use every last bit. But I'm also thinking the bottom's gonna have some silt and sediment from that sand going in and out too. So that's just something to think about with suspender slur. Now for investment, I use UltraVest. I get it from a Rio Grande jewelry supply. It comes in a 44 pound box. It's about a dollar a pound, so $44. But shipping on one box is 40 bucks. Plus tax, one 44 pound box is about 90 bucks to get it here. You save some money if you get in bulk, but investment isn't cheap either. So a $300 five gallon bucket or a 44 pound box of powder. On the bison, I use seven pounds of investment. Just round up because I'm bad with numbers, 14 bucks worth. So in the end, which one is better? It's really close. Both of them turned out really well. There are some subtle differences though. Apart from the ceramic shell breaking, the ceramic shell surface is very smooth and very uniform. It's a very high quality finish. There really aren't any defects at all. There's a very small crack where there's a little bit of flashing that I had to clear up. On the hindquarters, there's a few pinpricks. There are a few inclusions, very minor, and a few inclusions on the base by the feet. For the investment casting, I feel like the detail is a little bit sharper. For example, if I look at the hair around the foot here, on the investment model, it's just a little bit deeper, whereas the suspended slurry model is just very, very slightly smoothed out a little bit. So maybe just a little sharper detail for the investment. However, there are a few more inclusions in the investment model. If I look at the face, there's a few pin size holes. Again, very minor, but they are there. And on the base, there's a few flaws as well. Overall though, I'll let you guys tell me which method you prefer. There's a lot of variables when it comes to casting and some of the differences may have just been because of how I sprued it or the temperature of one metal or something like that. Either way, professionals use both methods for getting very high quality castings. So I'll let you decide which one you think is better. Let me know your favorite method of casting, what you thought of this video, and come on back for the next one. Thanks for watching.